The title of my sermon today is Return Faithless People. And um, if you are very well um, in uh, depth with understanding Prophet Jeremiah, uh, Prophet Jeremiah comes in a time where you know, he sees, uh, he prophesies, but he also sees the destruction of southern Judah. Okay? He prophesied about the destruction of uh, Jerusalem. He's going to prophesy that the people are going to be exiled, bad things are going to come, and it's because of the sin. Sin is so filled in the people of God. And because of that, God is determined to judge and punish them. So Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet because his heart was filled with sorrow. You know, all the message that God is giving is wrath, judgment. <laughs> and if you think about that, you know, uh, what a life. Like, everybody hates you because of the message you're delivering. And, you know, you don't want, he even expressed it, I don't want to do this, you know. But in his heart, there's this burning desire that he has to proclaim this message. And even though he proclaims this message, he also knows that the people would not come back to the Lord. Because in the prophecies, God was so determined. You know what? You guys are finished. Jerusalem is finished. You're out of my uh, promised land. You're going to be exiled into another nation. Um, but still, uh, even though there is judgment in most of Jeremiah's prophecies, we see a glimpse of God's heart. And, and even in chapter 3, it's mainly about judgment and destruction. Uh, but we see the heart of God, and it's, come back. I want you to come back. So um, let's go into this uh, short passage, because in here, we also recognize that, yes, God is so, so into restoring, um, recovering our relationship, a broken relationship with the Lord. If we go to, uh, straight to verse 19, uh, I myself said, uh, here I is God, okay? God in the voice of Jeremiah, in the prophecy of Jeremiah is saying, how gladly would I treat you like sons and give you a desirable land, the most beautiful inheritance of any land, of any nation. And this is something that God had already done. When the people were slaves in Egypt, he sent Moses and delivered them and promised them the land that was, skipped, that was promised to Abraham 400 years ago. And then after 400 years of, uh, of slavery in Egypt, uh, Moses is sent and he delivers the people and he, he leads them through his successor, Joshua, into the promised land. God did exactly what he promised. God is faithful. God loves us. This is something that he wanted. And he wanted to do this because he wanted to restore the broken relationship initiated by Adam and Eve's sin. Okay? God, out, we, in, we are Lord, you are not. And that is the original sin. So ever since that, God wants to come into our life, become our Lord again, become our God again. He wants to restore the uh, uh, lost paradise Eden again. So this promised land was a representation of a new Eden that was going to be seeded here and it was going to represent a blessing for all nations to see so that they will know that you are truly blessed when God rules, when God is king, when we are under his lordship. And he also wanted an intimate relationship because in verse 19, he said, I treat you like sons, not slaves, not some for foreign uh, people, but my people. Not only that, you're my sons, you're my daughters, and this is for you. I want to be a father for you. God says in verse 19, I thought you would call me father. 
because of all the blessings that I gave you. And because I was faithful, I gave you the desirable promised land as promised. I delivered you from powerful Egypt. I protected you. Forty years in the desert, I fed you. I led you. You know, you, had, you, you were provided water. I was with you. I thought you would call me father and not turn away from following me. Okay, this is what God's heart is. Here's what the present Israel, the people of God is like in verse 20 and 21. But like a woman, unfaithful. So in verse 19 alone, it's talking about, I have been faithful. But now in verse 20, but like a woman unfaithful to her husband, you, so you have been unfaithful to me. If you read uh, the first part of Jeremiah, God also describes his relationship with the people of God as husband and wife. We are, uh, we are uh, bonded together as an eternal covenant, but you broke the covenant. I have been faithful until now, but you have been so unfaithful. You have been unfaithful to me, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. And then in verse 21, God is saddened by the fact that, yes, they're crying out. They're recognizing something is wrong, but their cry is heard on the barren heights, the weeping and pleading of the people of Israel. Now, this barren heights is kind of important because this, they're not crying for a deliverer. Or, or, they're crying for something that's, that's wrong in their life. But they're crying on barren heights, which is the place where Jeremiah is saying, this is where you pray to or worship the idols, false gods. You should have cried and pleaded in front of me. In Jerusalem, in the holy city. But, but you are crying, weeping on the barren heights. This is what you're doing. Why? Because they have perverted their ways and they've forgotten the Lord their God. You know, um, we are homo sapiens, right? Somebody, some people call us homo religious. Is that Latin? Does it sound like Latin? <laughs> We're all religious in some sense because we are, uh, because we are created by God. We ever so have an innate uh, tendency to worship our Creator. But when this relationship is broken, you know, we're going to worship eventually something. And worshiping that is eventually going to be our motivator in life. And we call that idols. Idols mean something that I love more than God. Okay? If this relationship is not being aware by me, and uh, we are going to be deceived. Okay? In verse 23, it says, uh, this is a deception. Surely the idolatrous commotion on the hills and mountains is a deception because we think we're doing some kind of religious activity. We're crying, we're weeping, you know, we're pouring our heart out because of some issues, and there is a deity in front of us that we can see and touch. We're doing something, we're worshiping. And we think that this idol is going to, you know, uh, give a solution to us. But in reality, it's all a deception. We are doing our religious activities because, yes, we, we have an innate desire to worship some, someone. We're supposed to worship our God, Jehovah, but because of this uh, relationship broken by sin, we're going to worship something, whether it be money, success, uh, our, our, our family. I'm not saying it's a, it's a bad thing. But if that becomes our idol, then it's going to be a deception. 
We think we're, gonna, we're doing something that is meaningful. But eventually, we will recognize that will not truly give us satisfaction and happiness that God intended. Only when we come back to our Creator, only when we have an intimate relationship with Him, with him only when we truly uh, worship Him can our uh, everything Realign, right? So the uh, Saint Augustine said, "What is faith? It's all about realigning our loves, okay? And our first love should be the love for God, and then all of our loves will realign with that, okay? And once this love is not recognized." through God's grace, then we will forget and try to find something, okay, that will, you know, uh, work as another God, and it will become our idol, whether we recognize it clearly or not. And God is calling this, this is all false, a lie, a deception. And he's sending Jeremiah to tell the people you know, this is what you've been doing. You are, yes, very religious. You're doing something, a lot of activities. But in that, there's no true relationship with the Lord Jehovah. Okay? And I think uh, our faith starts with recognizing our present state. Okay? And when we recognize that, we want a deliverer. We want a savior. And God is going to send the Savior, right? So in here, God is saying in verse 22, Return, faithless people. I will cure you of backsliding. So there are two strong verbs here. And one is return, return. Return means to turn back on your old ways. And it could be translated directly to repent, because that's exactly what it means, to turn your ways, return. Okay. And uh, our relationship with the Lord always starts with true recognition of where I am right now in our relationship with the Lord and returning to him. So return faithless people says directly uh, what, uh, what the power of the true gospel is. Faithless people should return, okay? And God is telling them directly because he cares, he knows what's best for us. He knows that only with a true relationship with him can we be truly restored. But the thing is, Returning is repenting. Uh, it starts with, you know, a, a deep, deep uh, awakening of, yes, the, uh, the power of sin is so powerful. And my life, it's not going the way I want it to go. I'm in a total mess. I can't get out of here. So repent is, I want to turn. But the thing is, our human willpower cannot deliver us from this mess. So, yes, we want to repent, but what does it mean? First, it means you recognize the sins in your life, not as you as the determinator of what is sin or not, but with the perspective that God gives. And God gives what is sin or not through the written word. So, based on Scripture, am I a sinner? Based on what the Scripture says about sin, am I a sinner? And we have to recognize God's perspective on us, not our perspective on who I am or not. Hey, everything's going okay. I feel happy. And, you know, a lot of people, everybody, no one's perfect, right? We, we always like to say that. No one's perfect, meaning... It's okay to mess up because no one's perfect. It's kind of, you know, giving you a free pass on, yeah, we try, but we always mess up. Okay. So 
so is that the end period? Is that how we should live now? Okay, and recognize that, yeah, we always mess up, no one's perfect, so um, we go with the flow. Is, is that what it is? No. It's recognizing how sinful I am truly and turning of the heart, return, turning of the heart to God and asking him to give us the willpower and savior so that we could actually live out the ways God intends us to live. And the Old Testament in Jeremiah it says this is going to be a new covenant given by God. So let's go to that. <clears throat> um, but but before we go there, I just want to uh, you know divide the two verbs: return and I will cure you. Okay, divide it and uh, connect return with the baptism of repentance that was given by John the Baptist. Okay, because he baptized the people, and it was a baptism of repentance. Uh, it was not initially that they could change, but it was a start. But when Christ came, John the Baptist said, you know, a, a person who is greater than me will come. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, what does that mean? When the Holy Spirit comes, this is uh, connected with the second verb in verse 22, I will cure you of backsliding. Because when we are baptized with the Holy Spirit and we are filled with the Holy Spirit, then we are given, we are empowered to live to do the ways of the Lord. Okay. So if you rely only on the first part, return, I'm trying, I'm trying. Don't you get it? Look, I'm trying, but I'm not perfect. You're relying on yourself for the total repentance and even the cure. But return yet is recognizing sin, turning back to the Lord, and asking his help so that, yes, God said, I will cure you of backsliding. We're not going to have the willpower to change ourselves. It's actually... As we let uh, Jesus be the Lord of our life, if we recognize and we come to total obedience, the spirit of Jesus, which is the Holy Spirit, will give us the power to live out his ways. So uh, the last prophet in the Old Testament is Malachi. And, you know, this is exactly what has been prophesied in the last verses of the last prophet and book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, it says, See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. So, you know, it's sad. The Old Testament ends with the word curse, right? <laughs> because, uh, because of sin, we are cursed, and there is no way out. But God gives us a promise. He's going to send Elijah, and in the New Testament, Jesus said, this Elijah has come, and it is John the Baptist. So when John the Baptist is baptizing uh, with water, uh, it's the baptism of repentance. Turn your hearts to God. Come to him. Okay? And then he will cure us. And this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which I want to explain a little more. In Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 33, this may be the key verse in all of Jeremiah. It says that God uh, is going to make a new covenant. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. The Lord is faithful, we are not. The Lord is just, we are not. The Lord gives the laws, we can't live up to that law. That was what the Old Testament is saying. New Testament is saying, now, uh, 
Jeremiah is prophesying, well, God is going to give us a new testament, new covenant, okay? And this new covenant, when it comes, this is the covenant I will make the house of Israel after that time, declared the Lord. I will put my law in the minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. If, if the Old Testament way was, here's the law, obey it. Oh, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. Well, we can. If, if that's what the Old Testament is saying. The New Testament is saying, this is the word of God, and it's going to go enter into your heart. It's going to be in your mind. You will be able to live like that and think like that. How? Well, Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27 gives a more detail on how God is going to actually do that. So these are two very important passages. I hope you have it underlined, memorized, okay? Um, in Ezekiel, says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So this is when the role of the Holy Spirit comes in. Right? And this is the gospel message that was given to the apostles who were baptized by the Holy Spirit, filled, and they preached. Peter preached his first Pentecost sermon in Acts chapter 2. And this is uh, what happened to the people as they heard the message delivered by Simon Peter. Acts chapter 2, verse 37, 38. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized. So I want to connect this with return, faithless people, and be baptized. This is water baptism, but every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this part is the part where God is saying, I will cure you of backsliding. Okay? So when we repent, we turn our hearts to the Lord. Um, I can't depend on anything anymore, and I need you, Lord. Come into my life. Come into my life. I will go under your lordship, and, and, and may the Holy Spirit help me to live out your ways, right? We will receive the uh, gift of the Holy Spirit, and when we are spirit-filled, we are empowered to live what God requires, right? So this is fulfilled through who? Jesus, okay? So we're living in the uh, New Testament uh, age where everything is uh, fulfilled and given through Jesus Christ. We repent of our sins, and our sins are dealt with with the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. He resurrected so that we are given new life. He ascended into heaven so that he is the ultimate ruler and creator, and under his authority and lordship, if we strive to live, the Holy Spirit that is given to us as a gift will fill our hearts and empower us to live as God requires. Return, faithless people. As we return, faith will be given to us. And it's very interesting that in Galatians chapter 3, 23, the words are like this. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be re revealed. So it's equating faith with whom? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the faith for the faithless. So today's um, prophecy by Jeremiah is challenging us to come back to him and, and also uh, telling us to recognize 
the willpower that we have cannot overcome the power of sin. The willpower to submit under God's will, He will initiate the curing process. God will initiate through the uh, power of the Holy Spirit, empower us through faith, who is Jesus Christ, victory over sin and death. So after uh, this message is proclaimed in verse 23, surely, uh, uh, it, it says in the latter part of verse 23, surely in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. Yes, there is. So it seems like the real thing that we should really, really focus on is verse 24 and 25, which is really acknowledging um, the influence of sin and in God's perspective, not mine, based on scripture, based on uh, the uh, awareness that is given through the Holy Spirit, where I am dealing with sin. Because in verse 24 and 25, they recognize where they are. Not in their own per, uh, perspective, but in God's. And they said, from our youth, shameful gods have consumed the fruits of our father's labor, their flocks and herds, their sons and daughters, meaning that all of this was given to the idols. And some of the idols, uh, like Molech, required offering their sons and even daughters. And what is this? A religious life in deception, right? They, they saw this now. And then, let us lie down in our shame, and let, us, let our disgrace cover us. We have sinned against the Lord our God, both we and our fathers from our youth till this day. So it seems like they didn't recognize it, but eventually they did. And this is where everything starts. When we recognize where we are in sin, that is the starting point of God's grace. His amazing grace poured lavishly upon us. And I think this is the power of the gospel that we always, always need. When we come to Christ, he is ready to pour this love upon us. Fill our hearts with joy. Give the Holy Spirit that has already been in us full power so that we could live a victorious life in a deep, deep, intimate relationship with the Lord. Brothers and sisters, let's listen to the voice of God, His heart, and let us call Him Dear Father, Abba, which is an intimate calling from dear sons and daughters who are ultimately separated from him by sin, but who has ever so be reconnected as the family of God. So let's pray together based on today's scripture. It is the whole gospel message. And let's just respond to him and just ask him, you know, we have been busy in our lives. Where are we right now? And if God is truly calling us to come back and let him cure us, let's just ask of the Holy Spirit to guide us. Let's pray together.
Father God, open our eyes so that we recognize some of the areas in our life where we are unfaithful. We are um, faithless. Today you say, return faithless people and I will cure you. Yes, Lord. Give us this faith. Jesus Christ, we come back to him. Open our deceived eyes so that we could see you clearly. Stir in our hearts the filling of the Holy Spirit and cure us, empower us so that we could live a victorious life over sin. Jesus Christ conquered sin and death and in Christ we conquer sin and death also. Let us always be aware of where we are in our relationship with you and hear your words today as you call us to come back to you. Our Father, who loves us so much, bless us today with your love and grace. In Jesus' name we pray.